Good morning. The first item of business is general questions. Short and succinct questions and responses appreciated as ever. And at question number one, I call Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the timescale is for the completion of the Monklands replacement project. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Also, the outline business case for the Monklands replacement project estimates that the construction will complete in 2031. Richard Leonard. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, for that reply? Uh, the site for the replacement Monklands Hospital was first identified and approved over two years ago. In May 2021, the SNP manifesto said it would invest the capital required to build a new hospital. The outline business case was presented nearly six months ago, but at the same time a delay of three years was announced for its scheduled opening. Despite the dedication of the NHS staff, the current Monklands Hospital building is in poor health. People in Lanarkshire are beginning to ask me if the new hospital is going to be built at all. So can the Cabinet Secretary give a commitment today that there will be no reduction in capacity or in the range of services provided, that there will be no downgrading in build quality, that he will stick to the plans as outlined in the business case, and that there will be no further delays to its opening. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Senator Officer, look, the member will recognise is that we have got a very strong commitment to delivering uh, New Monklands Hospital. Uh, I know this is a, an issue that is very close to the heart of the local constituency member, uh, Neil Gray, as well. And we as a government are determined to make sure that that is delivered. Of course, the outline business case is being considered through the normal capital projects, project review process that we are going through. We have had to look at that process as a result of the cuts we have had to capital expenditure from the UK government that has a direct impact on capital projects in Scotland. We have to consider that in the round, uh, and that is why this process is going through identifying what our priorities are going forward, of which Monklands is one of those key uh, priorities. And I can assure the member that we will look at how we then take that forward to full business case. Now, the member made specific reference to aspects of the services that will be delivered within the hospital. Clearly, that is a matter for the health board to take forward, and that would be part of the final business case that would be produced. And we certainly would want to support them in taking an approach which is consistent with the way in which hospital projects have been delivered in the past. Graeme Simpson. <clears throat> Could the Cabinet Secretary answer the original question which was posed to him by Richard Leonard, Will there be any further delays? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, it always feels a bit ironic when you've got Conservative members who come into this chamber demanding capital investment yeah. projects be taken forward, when the very people who have been cutting capital expenditure yeah. to the Scottish Government are the Conservatives at Westminster, Mr Simpson's colleagues. And I'm surprised that Mr Simpson doesn't have doesn't have coach loads of constituents queuing up at his surgeries to complain about the impact that his party is having yeah. on capital investment projects here in Scotland, including vital projects like Monklands, which this government is determined to make sure is delivered. Question number two, Stephanie Callaghan. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the implementation of the Volunteering Action Plan. Cabinet Secretary, Shirley Ann Somerville. The Scottish Government appreciates the contribution that volunteers make to society. Our 10-year volunteering action plan, which was published in June 22, was co-produced with partners in the third sector, and its aim is to support people to volunteer throughout their lives. Volunteer Scotland is raising awareness of volunteering and its benefits for all involved. New groups have been established, including, for example, a cost of living volunteering task group and a policy champions network, ensuring that the powers of volunteering are recognised as policies are developed. Stephanie Callaghan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. And I welcome the plan's aim of creating an environment where everyone can volunteer more often and throughout their lives, and the plan's focus on tackling inequality for those who would traditionally experience barriers to volunteering. Can I ask the Minister what specific steps the Scottish Government is taking to increase public awareness of volunteering and to tackle those stereotypes around what it is and who it is that volunteers? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, Stephanie Calcan raises a, a very important point about the, the real need to encourage diversity in our volunteers. So, of course, the Scottish Government funds Volunteer Scotland as the National Advice Centre for Volunteering, and that does help to increase volunteering participation as well as widening access to volunteering. Volunteer Scotland have a search facility, for example, to ensure there is visibility of the volunteering options available to people. She is quite right to point to the, the need to ensure that volunteers come from a diverse um, backgrounds and that we have all uh, an obligation uh, to encourage uh, that and uh, certainly as a government we are determined to tackle those barriers um, in conjunction with Volunteer Scotland that may be uh, preventing people from coming forward. Question number three, Annabel Ewing. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met the Head of Housing Services at Fife Council and what was discussed. Paul McLennan. The Head of Housing Services at Fife Council last met with the Scottish Government in September last year. Matters concerning supply of affordable housing are high on the Scottish uh, Government's agenda as well as those of our local authority partners. And the decision in question concerning these and unrelated questions relevant to Fife Council, I plan to meet with Fife Council in the near future to continue these discussions. Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Presiding Officer, <coughs> excuse me, there are some 126 council house properties in my Cowdenbeath constituency that have been recorded on Fife Council's mould and dampness survey. And whilst Fife Council initially told me that remedial action would be taken by May of this year, sadly that timetable has now slipped, with no date at all having been set for the actual completion of such remedial works. Therefore, can the Minister advise whether he considers this to be a satisfactory position for my constituents who continue to live in unacceptable conditions? And what can the Minister do to quicken the necessary action? Minister. I am sorry to hear of the issues that the members' constituents are facing. Damp and mould in housing is a serious issue, and it is vital that landlords are proactive in identifying issues and taking action to treat the root causes. Whilst it is welcome to hear that Fife Council are committed to remedial action, it is of concern that this time frame has slipped and I hope that they have kept tenants up to date and are communicating their plans for resolving the issues effectively and in a timely manner. I will take up the matter with Fife Council and provide the member with an update. Thank you. Willie Rennie. The Minister knows that I am keen for action to be taken to halt the huge growth in short-term lets in my constituency. Now, whilst I did not support the licensing scheme, I do think the control areas could make a significant difference. Yet Fife Council, I think, is dragging its feet and has set a timescale for far too late. So when the Minister is speaking to Fife Council, will he have a discussion about the timescale for implementing the control areas? Minister. Can I thank Mr Rennie for that question. I was glad to meet up with Mr Rennie during the week to discuss housing issues in Fife. The Scottish Government gave powers to local authorities in reference to short-term let control areas and obviously any decision is, is, uh, is an issue that's up to them to, to discuss. Right, and, uh, obviously, we'll, we'll obviously get back to yourself in that regard, I would think. Question number four, Emma Harper. To ask the Scottish Government when it plans to lay regulations to restrict the marketing and advertising of vaping products following the publication of the responses to its consultation tightening rules on advertising promoting vaping products on the 27th of September 2022. Minister Jenny Minto. I thank Emma Harper for raising this very important issue. Our 2022 consultation proposed restrictions on vaping products that strike a balance between protecting all non-smokers from the potential harms of vaping, while providing existing adult smokers with the information they need to make an informed choice on cessation. We are actively considering these restrictions, including developing further evidence on the harms associated with vaping products, which was published on the 10th of May 2023, and we'll publish our refreshed tobacco action plan in the autumn. Emma Harper. <coughs> I thank the Minister for that answer. I am the co-convener of the Lung Health Cross Party Group and we have explored the issue of e-cigarettes and vaping. And what was presented was clear that young people are targeted directly using marketing strategies which include act attractive bright packaging and attractive flavours including candy floss, pink lemonade and bubblegum. Emerging evidence shows vaping is a future lung health ticking time bomb. Will the Minister commit to bringing the regulations forward as soon as possible to ensure we are protecting young people from the health harms of vaping? Minister. I, I thank Emma Harper for that supplementary question and recognise um, the concerns that she's raised. I was uh, visiting one of the schools in my constituency um, a couple of months ago 
and one of the teachers um, showed me the vapes that she had um, taken from the class that she was teaching. So as a priority, I am considering a range um, of what the next steps could be on vaping, including regulations, and this will form part of our Refresh Tobacco Action Plan in the autumn. Any action we seek to take will build on the regulations already in place to restrict the marketing, promotion and sale of vaping products to under-18s. Pam Duncan Glassy. Thank you, President Officer. A 16-year-old constituent recently contacted me because they're struggling to quit vaping. When they went to their GP and chemist for support, they were told there was nothing available to them. So what support can the Scottish Government provide to help young people quit vaping? Minister. I, reflect, I, re I recognise that as being the issue um, and currently, and I appreciate that the World Health Organisation described it as a, a major concern um, to, to people and it's something that I've been asking Public Health Scotland to look into and along with my colleague Elena Whittam, uh, we will be working together on this. Question number five, Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its commitment to abolish the NHS dental charges by the end of the current parliamentary session. Minister Jenny Minto. The Scottish Government remains committed to the removal of all dental charges in the lifetime of this Parliament. We have made initial progress towards this commitment with the extension of free NHS dental care to young people aged 18 to 25 years of age. The new policy prospectus provides a commitment to sustained and improved equitable national access to NHS dentistry. Pam Gossel. I thank the Minister for that, uh, that answer. My inbox has been flooded with emails from constituents and dental practitioners. One dentist wrote, many dedicated NHS colleagues can no longer see their futures working in a dysfunctional and underfunded system. It is our patients and your constituents who will end up paying the price. The Scottish Government pledged to make NHS dentistry free at the point of use by 2026, but that won't be of the concern if the SNP have prescribed over collapse of this NHS dental surgeries. Last week, the Minister was unable to provide assurances that there was no further delay to the reform process, but we do have a chance to build a service fit for the 21st century with prevention at its heart. So can I ask the Minister... What assurances can she give that reforms will not be delayed and that they will actually be effective? Minister. Uh, the single most important reform we can put in place, as I answered last week, uh, is payment reform. And that's what we're working on with the, the dentists uh, and their organisations as we speak. Um, our in, we, we have brought in the 10% bridging up until the 31st of October this year and our intention is to bring in the new payment structure which will hopefully be agreed by dentists on the 1st of November this year. Question number six, Marie McNair. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to maximise the uptake of the Scottish Social Security benefits. Cabinet Secretary, Shirley Ann Somerville. Our second benefit take-up strategy published in 2021 sets out our approach to ensuring that people are able and encouraged to access their entitlements. We remain focused on the removal of social barriers to people accessing Scottish benefits, addressing complex or costly access and improving access to information. We are delivering a number of take-up initiatives, including taking our services to locations most accessible to people through, for example, our local delivery service and running targeted marketing campaigns. We will publish our next annual update on benefit take-up rates in the autumn 2023. Marie McNair. I welcome the efforts that have been made in Scotland to maximise the take-up of Social Security benefits. This is vital given the impact of the Westminster imposed cost of living crisis is having on many. A recent report by Policy and Practice estimated that £7.5 of universal credit is not claimed. Universal credit is one of the passport benefits to the vital Scottish child payment. Does the Cabinet Secretary have concerns that the lack of a benefit take-up strategy from the UK Government to encourage take-up of universal credit could deny some families access to the Scottish child payment? 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, the member raises a very important point um, about a benefit take-up strategy, um, and uh, I would encourage uh, the DWP to do as the Scottish Government has done. However, what I would say is that it doesn't just take a benefit strategy, it also requires an entirely change in approach. So, for example, when we compare the Scottish Government's human rights approach to Social Security that encourages people to apply for what they're entitled to, and then compare that to the UK Government's degrading system, where there is still far too much signal stigma and far too many barriers in the way. That is exactly why it takes much more than a benefit strategy to improve the situation. Question number seven, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government when it plans to announce the delivery plan for the second strategic transport projects review. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Signif significant action is being taken by this Government to develop, deliver and invest in Scotland's strategic transport infrastructure for the long term. Work is already underway to deliver 38 of the 45 recommendations in STPR2, with consideration ongoing on how best to mobilise the remaining seven. Finlay Carson. I thank the Minister for that response, but it is hugely disappointing that the commitment made by Michael Matheson in January this year to release details surrounding the delivery plan for STPR2 are still not being forthcoming. Once again, it shows the utter contempt that the Scottish Government displays, particularly towards the people of the South West of Scotland, where regardless of the promises, despite those promises made year after year, the spend on infrastructure projects in the South has been less than 0.5 per cent of the national infrastructure spend. But thankfully to the Sir Peter Hendy review it, that highlighted the desperate need for serious investment in A75, including a, a bypass at Crockett Ford and Spring Home, we can now see these improvements are vital. I am aware that a business plan for these 75 has now question, been submitted. Can I have a question, please, Mr Carson? The, the business plan has been submitted, seeking uh, funding from the government. Can I ask the minister to tell me when he will do likewise and do the right thing and fulfil his commitment to once and for, for all provide finance towards these projects? Minister. Um, President officer, uh, I met with Mr Carson and other colleagues from the south of Scotland last week and uh, outlined some of the work that we are doing. Uh, as Mr Carson uh, is well aware, uh, I have uh, met with uh, uh, UK ministers uh, around about the A75 uh, to try and access uh, funding from the Union Connectivity Fund. A draft business case for the A75 has been submitted uh, to the Department of Transport, and that includes a proposal to fund the further design and development uh, of options for the realignment of the A75, uh, including uh, around the villages of Springholm and Crockettford, Crockettford, which I know Mr Carson uh, has an interest in. I hope that the UK Government will respond positively uh, and will hand over the resources that are required uh, in order to get these works going. Question number eight, Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to assist any businesses that are struggling to recruit skilled workers. Cabinet Secretary Murray. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. The action we are taking uh, to work with employers includes ongoing investment to deliver 25,500 new modern apprenticeship starts in 2023-24, uh, support for developing the young workforce to enable young people to prepare for work, and ongoing investment in short courses across tertiary education aimed at upskilling and reskilling. Uh, furthermore, through the establishment of a talent attraction and migration service uh, and our wider work uh, of a programme of work and that of our enterprise agencies, we will help employers uh, in key sectors to recruit workers from uh, outside of Scotland. Murdo Fraser. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that uh, response. Contrary to the claims often made in this chamber that Brexit has dried up the supply of migrant workers, the latest figures show the net legal migration to the United Kingdom has doubled since Brexit, yeah. is now at record levels and is projected to grow still further. The problem is that too few of these legal migrants to the UK come to Scotland. Yes. We lag behind every part of England, with the exception of the North East, when it comes to attracting immigrants. The SNP benches don't want to hear the no. facts on this, no. uh, presiding officer, no. because it doesn't suit their narrative. But the fact is Scotland is very badly compared to the other parts of the UK in terms of attracting legal migrants to come here and fill the vacancies that other businesses have. Yeah. So what more is the Scottish Government going to do 
to try and make Scotland a more attractive place for these migrant workers we need to come and work here. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I've already spoken about the implementation of a Talent Attraction and Migration Service to ensure that we can mitigate the difficulties that our employers have faced uh, post-Brexit, uh, where, I mean, Murdo Fraser must have been living in a cupboard Members. Uh, if he hasn't had the representation from employers in his area that I've had in my area uh, and across Scotland in terms of the impact that Brexit has had, or the cutting of freedom of movement and the impact that that has had. And we continue to call on the the UK government to ensure that they are having a more suitable immigration system that suits the needs of people here in Scotland. That is the work that I have been progressing in my previous role alongside Mary Goujon in terms of a rural visa pilot, for instance, that I know many on those benches would actually support, even if the Secretary of State for Scotland is currently holding it up. That concludes general questions. Before we move to First Minister's questions, I invite members to join me in welcoming to the gallery the Right Honourable Catherine Gotani Hara MP, Speaker of the National Assembly of Malawi. And I would also invite members to join me in welcoming Dr Hussam Zomlot, Head of the Palestinian Mission to the United Kingdom.